how many people does it take to die before we can call the systematic, systemic and endemic murders of innocent people a genocide? What do you do when the hands that are supposed to be helping you are the same hands who are robbing you? How do you fight off hunger when other people's greed leaves you empty, yet you're the one feeding them with your country's produce, but yet they call you underdeveloped? Think about it. For more than 20 years, the civil war in the Democratic Republic of Congo has been turning natural beauty into a scenery of violence. The forgotten war of the African continent has claimed until now more than 6 million lives, making it the most violent conflict since World War II. Triggered by the Rwandan genocide in 1994, the conflict has become economized, turning the focus of its many actors towards the vast natural riches of the country. Through this process, the conflict reoriented from their original goals towards profit from extraction or trade of cotton, one of the conflict minerals included in most electronic devices. In the course of this conflict, the violence has become the main mode of discourse and war has become continuation of politics by other means, a way of creating an alternative system of profit, power and protection. The Eastern DRC conflict has included nine countries and more than 40 rebel groups. Not only does Eastern Congo function as a refuge to Rwandan, Burundian and Ugandan rebel groups, but also do the official counter forces from neighboring countries transform Eastern DRC into a combat zone. And within this lengthy and bloody civil war, the armed forces of Congo are responsible for a large portion of the violence against the Congolese people. It is therefore no surprise that the military-civilian relationship is very strained and tense in the DRC. Eighty thousand women a year are raped in the UK. Over 400,000 alone in Eastern Congo one year. But unlike the UK, there is no justice system that we can run to, so our mothers are left desolate, our daughters walk in shame, and our sisters hang their heads. In order to trace how the army could turn against its own people, we need to zoom into its historical development. The first mention of the army comes from the period before independence, when the Berlin Conference declared the Belgian king, Leopold II, as the only ruler over the Congo Basin in 1888. La Force Publique was established to exploit the state, promote the nation-building process, and not to defend the Congolese people, but the colonial authorities only. This was manifested through their task to suppress indigenous and mass revolts. Nevertheless, these armed forces were still the most efficient and disciplined army the Congo has ever had. Ever since the independence in June 1960, the military unison crumbled due to numerous mutinies led against the central authorities. Many times the region started to war against each other also for ethnic and secessionist motives. The new generation of soldiers became politicized as they saw the times during independence as an opportunity to achieve personal gains by being affiliated to political figures. Geopolitical divisions were exacerbated by the clashing power of the Soviet Union and the US, making Congo another proxy of the Cold War. Before Mobutu seized power, the government fighting rebel groups was supported by the Soviet Union. But after the coup d'etat by Mobutu, the authoritative leader of Congo from 1965 until 1997, Congo became yet again dependent on European powers. When the US cut off financial aid to Mobutu after the Cold War. This also triggered the first post-independence democratization process of la Conférence Nationale Souveraine. However, all efforts towards democracy were reversed with the breakout of the Congo War, following Laurent Kabila's seizure of power in the coup d'état of May 1997. The war exposed the deficiencies and internal divisions within the military which was dependent on the reinforcements from neighboring countries to defeat Kabila's opposition. In the course of this war, Congo became the scenery for massive destruction of property, human rights violations, killings and rapes. Even though the Congo war has long ended, the conflict in East Congo still rages on. Life expectancy has fallen to 52 years and the country has been reduced to a site of unstilled resource extraction. The Congolese armed forces are now what we call extractive institutions, 
instead of stabilizing the country and fostering economic growth, they are a means to enforce power from above while personally profiting from the ongoing conflict. An important fact is that the armed forces are facing substantial difficulties in providing equipment and support to the soldiers. Going without salary for months has weakened their loyalty towards their authorities and further incentivized them to raid civilians. The violent character of the army towards its people has also historical roots. Never in history were these forces meant to maintain the law or to uphold civil and human rights. In Machiavelli's work The Prince, violence is justified as a means towards stability, the maintenance of the ruler and the overall benefit of the community. As he states, there are two kinds of combat, one with laws, the other with force. The first is proper to man, the second to beasts. But because the first is often not enough, one must have recourse to the second. However, his attitude towards political violence is one of disdain, as he believes that it will ultimately lead to the destruction of the perpetrator himself. Necessary evil, although excusable, is for him still immoral evil. If Machiavelli looked into the conflict of Congo, he would condemn the ambitions of the military of personal enrichment, because they would go against the well-being of the civil society. According to Hannah Arendt, politics is horizontal. It is exercised through dialogue and ceases to exist once it loses its support. In the Congolese case, violence has erased power and the human's ability to act in concert was replaced by destructive violence. The army's violence is purely instrumental because it does not lead to an establishment or consolidation of the rule of law, but instead furthers the desolation of society. Violence is incapable of speech, and speech is helpless when confronted with violence. Through this, the society falls into a condition of lawlessness in which terror takes full control. Wolfgang Kaleck, founder of the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights and jury member of the Congo Tribunal, argues that the Congo Tribunal project has been able to open the door to justice in Congo. In order to ensure that the project has a lasting effect, the positive reception of the vision of a real tribunal in Congo must now be supported from here. It is, of course, not only about the responsibility of Congolese actors, such as the government in that country and the armed gangs, but also about the responsibility of Western states, international organizations and transnational corporations. <laughs>